good afternoon, Jehin. Welcome back, everybody, to our day two session five. I'm Satya Pulkuri, a host for this session. I'm the uh, associate editor for the forum. In the previous sessions of our International Counterterrorism Conference, we have focused on decoding terror threats in South Asia, West Asia, Africa, the West, and India Israel counterterrorism approach. On this note, uh, today our fifth session will be on Indian Army's non kinetic approach to counterterrorism. So, without any further ado, I extend a warm welcome to our session chair. Let me uh, allow me to introduce a uh, Major General RPS Baduria, Visit to Seva Medal. Sir is presently head of uh, Center for Strategic Studies and Simulation at the United Service Institution of India, New Delhi. He regularly conducts strategic gaming exercises for the National Defense College, Army War College, and the Indian Foreign Service Institute. He retired from the faculty of National Defense College, New Delhi, in February 2016, after serving in the Indian Army for 36 years. General has a vast experience in anti-terrorist operations, both at policy formulation and execution level. He has commanded a mountain division and brigade. He has held many prestigious staff appointments at the command and army headquarters. He has the unique experience of rising two large formations, that is division and mountain corps. He holds a master of philosophy degree in national security and strategic studies from Madras University, India. He has attended course on politics and strategic affairs at the Escola Superior de Guerra in Brazil. General has deep interest in researching and writing on the security environment in the Indo-Pacific region, particularly in the South Asia. Uh, now let's welcome our uh, key speakers. We have Major General Dr. Rajan Kochasa, Vishishti Seva Medal, PhD retired. Uh, Lieutenant General Vinod Bhatia, sir, Param Vishishti Seva Medal, Atya Vishishti Seva Medal, Sena Medal, retired. And uh, our uh, next speaker, Lieutenant General Shokin Chauhan, sir, Param Vishishti Seva Medal, Atya Vishishti Seva Medal, Seva, Sena Medal, Vishishti Seva Medal, retired, PhD. Uh, uh, for other speakers. Uh, over to you, sir. Baduria, sir. Right. Thank you very much. And mm -hmm. good afternoon to all the participants of this webinar. Uh, to begin with, I want to con congratulate the INDIC Research Forum uh, for choosing this theme of this session, which is Indian Army's non kinetic approach to counter terrorism operations. Now, I say this uh, because, in the perception of the population, the armed forces and the Indian Army in particular are associated with use of kinetic power or means uh, uh, for war fighting or even fighting the terrorism or a proxy war in Jammu and Kashmir or dealing with insurgencies in Northeast region. But little is known or discussed with our people about the use of non-kinetic means which the Indian Army uses to either fight the proxy war or in the management of the insurgencies in Northeast. Now, Indian Army has been running a program called Op Sadbhavna for decades in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, it is basically to ameliorate uh, the sufferings of the population as a result of terrorist actions or even our own counter terrorism actions like carrying out cordon search or raids, where the population is put to a lot of difficulties. Uh, even the children cannot go to school and things like that. Now, this program includes uh, construction of schools, construction of roads, community centers, and other facilities by which the lives of the normal people is made better. Now, this also gives a bit of advantage to the Indian Army in that it provides the space to carry out operations and reach out to the rem remote corners of the state where the civil administration has not reached due to due to the security reasons or lack of capacity. Uh, besides this, the Indian Army also runs psychological operations uh, for perception management. Now, this is to present our narrative to counter the kind of narrative which is going on, uh, particularly in Valley or even in Northeast, uh, that is to radicalize the people. Now, that's our, one of the very big challenges uh, to counter this narrative, and that is where Indian Army runs its psychological operations which Jan Bhatia would be talking about in greater detail. Likewise, in the Northeast region, we have been running similar programs for decades. And we have a program called Operation Good Samaritan for the people in the border areas, suspension of operations, also called SU, uh, the, uh, which is a policy for surrenderies, and so on. This gives the chance to the misguided youth to join the mainstream 
and integrate them with the society. Now, these programs are planned and executed very deliberately and monitored at the apex level of the hierarchy or the leadership. Today, uh, we have an experienced and outstanding panel to, to throw more light uh, on use of non-kinetic means by the Indian Army. Uh, the first speaker would be General uh, and Dr. Rajan Kocha, who will be speaking on confidence building measures in conflict region. He is a veteran with experience in dealing with the issues in both Jammu and Kashmir and Northeast region. He holds doctorate in the emotional intelligence and in a conflict NLP uh, uh, pra uh, practitioner coach. I'm sorry for the this thing. Then uh, the second speaker is a very well renowned veteran who's on the TV giving out his views. He'll be speaking on perception management and psychological operations to counter terrorism. Uh, General Vinod Bhatia uh, has been our former uh, DGMO and uh, he has uh, been responsible for the ceasefire that we see on the LOC. Uh, he has um, served both on LAC and LOC at a very high level. Uh, then third speaker is Jan Shokin Chauhan, uh, who will be speaking on rehabilitation and reintegration of the surrendered uh, militants. He is former DGSM Rifles and chairman of the ceasefire monitoring group. He has also been a DA in Nepal. Now I'll invite Dr. Rajan Kochan uh, to speak on confidence building measures in conflict region. Over to you, General. I think we can't speak. Thank you very much, sir, uh, Ajal Madhurya, sir, uh, for your introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, be a part of this a wonderful panel. Ajal Bhatia, I know him extremely well. He's my neighbor in Greater Noida. And Jal Shokin Chauhan is from my school. So it's a pleasure to be a part of this wonderful panel. My topic uh, is uh, extremely vast. Confidence building the measures in conflict regions. So I have made an endeavor to uh, focus on our country and especially Pakistan and China. Because that is more relevant to us and I have tried to take out the best practices in confidence building which possibly uh, uh, you know it contributes a lot to peacekeeping. Uh, India is one sixth of the world's humanity and its people aspire for a prosperous and a safe future in which they pursue their dreams without fear. But to achieve this, it is extremely important to have a congenial external and internal environment in which the country could make its place in world affairs and be shielded from global and regional risks. Therefore, the management and security of our borders are of paramount importance. One is reminded of the famous quote, a God made a land and a man made the boundaries. An overview of, the, of our own security environment today makes very interesting reading. We share a very uneasy neighborhood, have boundaries with the six countries, have almost 15,000 kilometers of extent of the land borders, with 10,000 kilometers of these contested with uh, acrimonious neighbors. Uh, today, in the West and North, we have unsettled borders here. And uh, therefore, this understanding of the conflict building uh, measures is very important. Uh, nations the world over use confidence building measures as an essential instrument for conflict resolution towards the perceived threats. However, the volatile situations are prevalent in our own subcontinent, in the Middle East. And therefore, the success of CBNs 
have been widely contested. At times, it becomes extremely difficult to quantify the effect of CBMs, as most of these measures have an element of intangibility, as articulated by uh, Deitelhoff and uh, Zimmerman. We could analyze the impact of CBM using two important parameters. One is the compliance, and the other is implementation. So, uh, and as we uh, go along in my uh, talk, I would uh, like the viewers to focus their attention on compliance and implementation because these two uh, factors will be extremely important in. Uh, analyzing the efficacy of our CBMs. The basic idea of a CBM is to establish a shared trust, uh, preventing enhancement in conflicts and hostilities, and finally uh, treading towards a positive peace. A CBMs today, we all need to understand can be distinctly differentiated from treaties, accords, or agreements because there is no obligation of the nations to honor these commitments. And for its non compliance, we cannot take up this issue with any uh, international course of arbitration. Uh, whenever we talk about the uh, CBMs, we have to uh, clearly define its objective. So the objective is to reduce hostilities and therefore the CBMs can be classified into two major areas, uh, military and non-military. Uh, some thinkers have also uh, classified them as uh, formal and informal. Uh, military, we are all aware and we are going to discuss this in detail. Uh, the the non-military aspects have a very a large canvas, uh, such as uh, diplomatic, uh, political, economic, environmental, and so on. Uh, taking this as a backdrop, we have to understand that uh, how uh, CBMs have impacted Pakistan and China. Uh, CBMs, as we all know, have to be uh, thought of in two dimensions. Uh, one is the nuclear and the other is the non-nuclear dimension. And if we look at India and Pakistan with regard to the nuclear dimension, we see a definite uh, failure uh, uh, to the adherence of uh, norms as uh, evident by uh, both the countries who are expanding their arsenals of uh, nuclear and ballistic uh, missiles uh, weaponry. A recent uh, newspaper uh, report, I'm sure all of us have uh, read, which states that Pakistan has uh, uh, progressed a lot as uh, far as its nuclear uh, weaponry is concerned. Uh, so uh, there is also uh, no agreement or acceptance in our subcontinent to uh, designate a, a nuclear uh, a free zone. So I would be uh, reasonably uh, correct if I state that on the nuclear front, apart from the deterrence aspect, we haven't had a trust with each other. And the second aspect is that uh, since we have on the non-nuclear aspect, because that is more important to us today, uh, since our partition in 1947, uh, uh, Pakistan has resorted to a proxy war, uh, a gray zone warfare. So CBMs have been applied because in spite of instruments like uh, Tashkent uh, Declaration 1966, uh, Shimla Agreement 1972, and the Lahore Declaration 1999, we really haven't established that kind of confidence of building with each other. And we are uh, well aware how we were stabbed in the back when uh, Kargil happened. And even after Kargil, we are still seeing the Pulpama and Uri attacks and a recent Rajori attack. 
so this situation on the uh, loc i'm uh, had a positive note in february uh, 2021 when when ceasefire was announced and this uh, firing uh, or the cross border or firing was stopped but apart from that uh, there has been no let ups on account of uh, infiltration and so many other issues and now we look at china we have a standing border issue with china and we know that china is there on the lsc and china maintained its stand on the 1959 claim line and it has a different perception on the line of actual control and over the years we have had a series of agreements and perfectly meeting the measures between the two countries but in spite of all that the incursions happened the galwan happened and so we are uh, now faced with a dilemma that have these confidence building measures really yielded any a major impact on the relations between our neighbors uh Uh, let us now have a look at the instruments uh, which are uh, uh, used in the confidence uh, building uh, measures, and uh, we'll be able to analyze that exactly. That uh, uh, what is both applicable in our own context, and what the kind of uh, CBMs can be used effectively in the coming uh, future. Uh, coming to the military. Uh, CBMs. We are all aware about the military commanders' uh, talks, which actually happen on the borders. We are aware that uh, there is a buffer zone. Uh, we have already uh, done it with the China. Uh, creating a delimitation zone is also another uh, way of confrontation building. Uh, establishment of hotlines. Uh, moving artillery uh, beyond the designated firing ranges. Uh, these are uh, some of the Uh, measures which uh, we have tried, and the latest being that uh, we are in the process of establishing a hotline with China. Uh, I will take your uh, I take your attention also to the 1965 Indo-Pak War, uh, where the first ever military uh, CBM was the civil avoidance strategy. Uh, civil areas were spared in that war, so it was a joint. a management approach between uh, the two nations it is extremely important uh, when we are establishing our uh, military cbms to establish the ground rules for a military exercise to avoid outbreak of a conflict we uh, india pakistan and china we all undertake our uh, military exercises along the borders it is important to establish a contact with each other inform each other uh, whenever we uh, undertake this division level or the core level exercises but we have seen in the past for example i will take your attention to brass tacks in uh, 1987 and zarb e mumin pakistan exercise 1989 when these two exercises took place uh, no effort was made to inform the adversary that that we were doing this exercise so it is important here to understand that if we have to build up a confidence with each other we must keep each other informed on these type of activities and uh, from the non military point of view i would uh, uh, take your uh, focus on the track to diplomacy which has played a very important role in and is an important tool of a confidence building the uh, uh, measure and for example a uh, nibrana dialogue a uh, chapro attack uh, dialogues between india and uh, pakistan have been extremely successful in the past so we uh, need to focus on this area also apart from the military cbms on the track to the diplomacy which also actually gives excellent results one of the most important method of 
uh, CBM as we have actually seen for ourselves in the people to people contact, NGOs, the trade and uh, military uh, cooperation, and the cultural exchange. And most important today, a civil society will play a very important role in influencing and shaping how individuals, communities, institutions, and states behave with each other. So it is, it, here it is very important, and the role of social media actually comes up in a big way. So I would bring one important aspect here for the CBNs to embrace strategic communication. Strategic communication use of social media is an extremely important method in uh, removing those kind of uh, mindsets we have for each other, or the hatred we have for each other. Because ultimately, these confidence in building measures can only succeed if the mindset of the people of two countries can change. And for that, a lot of work will have to be done because as far as strategic communication is concerned, uh, India has not done enough on that. And I'm sure the government is looking at this factor. And it's uh, most important for any CBM to succeed is we have to reduce the suspicions among each other. A clear intent has to be there. A transparency in our thought and processes. So unless we incorporate all these aspects, I'm, I'm afraid uh, we won't make any uh, much headway. And uh, the challenges which are ahead of us today is that if we look at uh, China, uh, China does not recognize any uh, treaty, any uh, CBM or any kind of mutual uh, trust with each other. So uh, there is a trust deficit with China today. So a lot will have to be done at the people to people level at the track to diplomacy, uh, uh, the meeting between the top leaders of the country will have to develop this sort of uh, confidence and uh, move ahead. And lastly, it is important that a CBM as a tool is not a stand alone uh, measure to restore confidences between the two nations. It has to be a synergized approach. It has to be a joint approach in which the agreements, the uh, policies which we emanate, our own border policy, our uh, foreign uh, uh, policy, and most important, but the statement of the political leaders. We cannot afford to make irresponsible statements in parliament and uh, uh, break this confidence of building with the nations. Our uh, politicians have to be more responsible in what they speak and in what uh, forums they speak is also uh, very important. They can speak uh, something in, in an election rally. It will uh, not be taken much cognizance of. But uh, once they speak in the parliament or uh, in things like this, it actually gets reflected as a, a viewpoint of a country and it can be taken otherwise as a part of the diplomatic things are concerned. So uh, these are the important factors I thought uh, that uh, confidence building measures are good, but they alone uh, cannot bring you peace. We have to have a lot of other sort of measures uh, like people to people contact, uh, changing the mindsets of the country, the cultural aspects, uh, the educational aspects, the trade aspects, the economic aspects. So, all these uh, things have to be uh, combined as a package in, in case you want any confidence building the, uh, uh, measure to succeed between two nations. Uh, thank you, sir. I finished. Uh, Jen. Uh, thank you, General Kocha, and that was wonderful uh, in highlighting the uh, kind of uh, confidence building measures that is both military and non-military and the importance of them, particularly in the context of South Asia. Uh, as far as India is concerned, we have 
two neighbors, both very hostile. We do not share borders with, I mean, we have border dispute with them and all three are nuclear. So therefore, the importance of confidence building measures uh, go up by many magnitude. He's also highlighted the mistrust that is prevailing between these uh, three countries. Uh, and during this, in this kind of a mistrust, how do we build confidence is a challenge which I'm sure um, the uh, leaders of these three countries would be looking at. Now, we will have question and answer session later in which some more issues would be highlighted. Uh, but now I'll request Jan Vinod Bhatia to speak to us on perception management and psychological operations uh, to counter terrorism. Jan Bhatia, sir. So you are muted. I'm audible now. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Indic Researchers Forum. Uh, great to be on the same platform with the uh, fellow soldiers and friends, General Rakesh Budari, our Chair, uh, General Rajan Kochar, and General Shokin Chohan. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, I think uh, the construct of the uh, complete uh, uh, two day is very interesting. Uh, counter terrorism, and especially session five, when we talk of uh, non kinetic means. Uh, and quite surprised uh, that the organizers have chosen three military men uh, uh, to speak and one very, you know, you know another military man who is very good uh, at counter insurgency uh, to be chairing the session. Uh, uh, normally, non kinetic would have meant uh, you got academies and others, but uh, that's for the learning. Uh, but then I, you know, I do appreciate that because. Uh, the military is not only kinetic. I think th this is something uh, uh, mindset which needs to be addressed. And uh, thank you for this. Uh, uh, I, I don't know the design by default, but whatever it is, I, I think it's very interesting. Uh, uh, so uh, the to uh, the topic given to me in my, uh, the brief given to me is to detail the perception management in uh, psychological operations and counterterrorism uh, situations. It's a very interesting story. Uh, yesterday, like I said, uh, city of counterterrorism is not about kinetic alone. Kinetic is only the beginning, it's one part of it. Uh, it is more to do with the uh, what we call uh, economic development, uh, finances, uh, the VAM that is winning of hearts and minds is basically perception management. In addition to what we do, uh, it's informational in nature. Uh, it is diplomatic because diplomacy plays a very important role. And I, I spoke about a success story yesterday uh, of Mizoram uh, of the Northeast. And also of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, where to a large extent now we find uh, that things have, uh, uh, have really uh, been very quiet, uh, relatively. And uh, I will take this outside of India also and uh, try and do some comparisons uh, with Sri Lanka, uh, with uh, Afghanistan, uh, with Vietnam. Uh, let me saw it pans out in the time. So what, what do we have? We have perception management and psychological operations. Right. So perception management uh, is exceedingly important. Uh, I'll, I'll be more anecdotal than analytical. Uh, pardon my this thing, but I can be analytical, but I'd rather be anecdotal to draw the right lessons. And uh, one of the, you know, in the, the session today I started with uh, uh, my friend uh, Air Marshal Anil Khosla talking of uh, air power and he of course uh, alluded to Balakot uh, and even the organizers have said Balakot. So let me challenge the very concept, the very word Balakot, because that's perception management. Balakot, as we believe it, was actually a raid on a precision airstrike on the Jash terrorist camp at Jabatov. It's a training terrorist camp, and that's what uh, Air Marshal Kostov says. That's that well known. Now, Jabatov is located about 20 to 23 kilometers away uh, from Balakot, which is a town, and it's a it's a isolated hill. Uh, there's no collateral damage possibility because there's no one staying across. And uh, we hit the terrorist training camp of Jash at Jabatov. But how did it come to know Balakot? So, the, the, you know, when I say perception management, and today we all, including the people who are who are either directly or indirectly involved, have also started calling it Balakot. 
right so this is the perceptions in balakot or i would say jabba top uh, precision strikes we won the battle and lost the war so this is the anecdote which i am going to touch upon because of perception management because of counter terrorism is all about perceptions all about winning the hearts and minds of the people it is a people it's a people centric people the central gravity a uh, people are the centrality of everything and if the people believe and the people talk and people talk to each other saying that we are doing well no uh, i think we are doing well and uh, i'll i'll come back come back to another anecdote of buran wahani uh, how it uh, uh, you know perception he we talk about perception <coughs> going back to jabata <coughs> what do we do we had an excellent military precision strike by indian air force inside pakistan territory like the odi surgical strike which was our territory and pakistan said that you know uh, the uh, the security forces the, the indian army special forces have not carried out the strikes in pakistan they absolutely right because the pakistan occupied kashmir that started it's not pakistan territory but this is for this particular instance we went to and we did a strike inside pakistan right pakistan territory but what happened thereafter i think uh, in the initial stage uh, after uri where we had uh, done very well both at the tactical level operational level at the strategic level and the informational level the perception management level uh, i think we lost the plot thereafter and pakistan picked up the threats so we find uh, the dg ispr at around 5:32 in the morning uh, tweeting uh, that indian air force uh, uh, air strikes were carried out at a place called balakot uh, where no damage has been done and the balakot word started picking up now having come at 25 day when having known the area of rajori punch balakot is also a village uh, in uh, rajori area uh, so it's a border village so I, i i saw that in the morning i said balakot why should air force even be touched to so balakot but balakot is within uh, small arms uh, range so balakot is a word which caught on and though the initial uh, press uh, brief by the foreign secretary was very very categorical that we have carried out preemptive operations in that uh, we wanted to uh, you know preemptive means uh, it is a preemptive op it's not punitive not proactive it's preemptive ops because we had information that terrorists were being trained at jabba top to carry out uh, suicide attacks uh, within india uh, so that was uh, a very good statement but then we went on to lose a plot and pakistan took over the plot we kept shifting narratives uh, from the narrative and went on to swift retort went on to uh, helicopter this thing and thereafter you know uh, unfortunate incidents took place uh, uh, amit 21 loss uh, abhinandan f16 and in the whole thing the centrality of pulwama which was just at belam got lost right what was just at belam what was the justice for doing our strikes was pulwama we never had the centrality of pulwama unlike uri still not uri so pulwama we lost it and we started calling it Palakot, and even today we call it Palakot. So my request is that perceptions are very important. We won, we won the battle, but lost the war. Why? Because of perceptions. We could not handle the uh, the information war. We could not manage the perceptions. Not only our, uh, of the people of Pakistan, of our own people, and and international community also. So uh, that is uh, a fact of life. Uh, second thing uh, now I'd like to talk about is how, how do you know psychological operations work? Well, Uh, and I'm talking about cycle. I'll come back to perception, and I keep jumping over to the other. As old as Mahabharat, it, it dates back to that. On the tenth day of the Mahabharat, after Vishnu Pitama had fallen, uh, Drona Chale, Drona he Chale took over the uh, the Kaurav army, and Krishna uh, knew very well that no one in the world could ever defeat uh, Drona Chale. So what was what he suggested and planned was. that yudhishthir who is known as the you know uh, as the god of truth dharm uh, dharmputra as uh, son of god son of son of uh, dharmputra he would say that ashwatthama has been killed now ashwatthama was also uh, the son of drona drona chale and when yudhishthir said that which was basically an elephant he didn't tell a lie and drona could not fight thereafter and that is the fall of the 
porous. So that is a sort of a cycle, cycle of operation. So there's a two, two things which I'm going to talk about, perception management and cycle The perception of coming back to perception management, uh, I've spoken about uh, uh, Jabba Top, and let's start calling it Jabba Top. Why should you, why should you follow uh, the Pakistani construct? It is Jabba Top for us, right? Well, in any terrorism operation, the perception management is the most important. People-centric operations, uh, it was uh, the chair covered it very well initially, saying that we do get your officer Bhavna, yes, in a big way, and uh, these are well received. Uh, but my point has always been why do you call it operation Sad Bhavna? Officer operation, operation Sad Bhavna. It's not a Sad Bhavna, how can Sad Bhavna be an operation? Right? We do coordinate such operations, we do raid, we do, you know, house and these are all operations. Uh, but how can Sad Bhavna become an operation? But, the fact is that if we do not call it operation, uh, the defense accounts have passed the bills because it has to be operation, right? So these are small things, but I'm talking the open for open domain. So we should do Sadhbhavna as Sadhbhavna, not as operational Sadhbhavna, small thing, but perceptions again uh, matter. Now you look at the changes which have come about in the, in the last uh, few years. Uh, we have done exceedingly well uh, in uh, uh, perception management in the year 2013 we have a unified headquarters uh, headed by the chief minister uh, with the security advisors uh, from the army the, the police uh, the civil administration and in 2013 a security advisor not exactly a security advisor, but another advisor who was the advisor for perception management was added to the UHQ. So the thought has always been there, but uh, formally uh, and, uh, it was added and how to, how to carry out the perception management. And we can see the changes thereafter. After 2016, again, Buranwani, uh, 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 the perception was that Buranwani made himself to a uh, role model and the Kashmiri youth want to follow him. And after the after Buranwani neutralized, there was, the valley had to be controlled, honestly. It, it had to be controlled. But we see Good changes thereafter. Even before in 2013 to the 14, uh, the in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, the, the the psychological operation perception management is done from Pakistan, as is uh, the terror actually perpetrated there. Because in Kashmir we only grow uh, saffron and apples. We do not grow weapons. The weapons do come from Pakistan, and Pakistan lays down the perception management information. Why they started this? Not in not in 1990 when uh, they started the uh, the proxy war, uh, but a few years before that, but that's the uh, time they took uh, to this thing. So, uh, they should come out with a booklet uh, uh, with the uh, Sayyid Gilani, the Hurriyat uh, leaders, uh, photograph, and they should give the calendar on what used to be done. So, uh, what did uh, we do? We, we The same book, the same photograph, but inside the material was different. Right? So, the, that changed the perception. At slow and steady today, you find that even Lal Chok on 15th August is full of uh, uh, Indian flags and Indian, you know, uh, uh, national anthem and everything. And some of you who must have watched the television on the 14th of August, you, you found in the Bakshi Stadium, the marching contingent, especially of the NCC and the girls in Shirnagar, uh, Bakshi Stadium Shirnagar, was absolutely class. It was a wonderful absolute, better than some of the uh, contingent in March on the Republic Day. So that is a change which perception has brought uh, into uh, the thinking of people. So perceptions are very, very important. Uh, to say that we have structures uh, for in system perception management, no, we don't have. A lot has been talked about, but we need is formal structures, formal systems. Uh, for perception management right now, uh, for the Army ADP does it, for the Air Force, it's been done by the, uh, by the Air Force, but for the Navy. Uh, and we have one of the largest uh, uh, outreach programs in the Ministry of uh, Information Broadcasting, MIB, uh, which controls, uh, which has a two version, which has the largest reach. Uh, we also have uh, on the radio, we have, uh, which has a very large reach. Uh, but we have, a, we are a late starter. But we should now come in for date over advantage. There is perception management things, perception management is concerned. So, what do we need? We need at the apex level, I think uh, one of the suggestions is that it's going to be controlled by the National Security Council uh, because they can get all the uh, various stakeholders together the various stakeholders, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Home, the Ministry of Information Broadcasting, 
uh, Ministry of Science, Ministry of Communication, uh, Ministry of Finance, because you need finances for that. So you get everyone together and you have you have a perception management plan, a vision, uh, which is about, let's say, 15 years from today. Uh, you have a strategy, perception management strategy, what we talk of, uh, you know, strategy communication, which General Kochi Kochi spoke about. Uh, we have a perception management strategy for the next seven years. And then an action plan to take two to three years, right? So the action plan is uh, two to three years. Uh, so this is the structure we want. We need influ influencers. We need we, we we need influencers in uh, this and influencers, especially for all all uh, particular things. For Kashmir Valley, we're different. For the Yori South of people, we're different. For the North, we're different. Uh, we have uh, influencers who are in the uh, in the counter terrorism grid in uh, uh, basically the hinterland LW would be different. So you have influencers out there, and you have you run a campaign of perception management. It is exceedingly exceedingly important, and we could take a leap for a DGISPR who do it very very well. Uh, uh, I'm okay with time. I think I got another uh, five to seven minutes. So uh, now we also have to look at psychological operations. Now psychological operations are twofold. And psychological operations, you address the general population uh, of uh, the target country. Uh, I'll take the example, like I said, I'll be anecdotal. Let me take the example of Galwa, uh, recent one, and everyone's aware of it. So Galwa. Now, what did the Chinese do? You know, as we all know, Chinese have a three warfare strategy. The three warfare being uh, public opinion, psychological operations, and legal warfare. Right. So what did they do? In Galwan, they never let out the number of fatalities which the PLA suffered. And that they thought would give them moral ascendancy. We, of course, are a democratic country, we're open country, transparent. And uh, we had uh, uh, Kansantosh Babu and 19 of our soldiers who made the supreme sacrifice. But the PLA would never give out the figures. And the figures were ranging from four, which the PLA officially claimed, to about 46, which uh, the Russian media came and later on uh, recently the Australian media has uh, pieced it together from various forums and social media platforms and all. So let's say let's say they, they had casualty in the range of about 40 odd. And suddenly for they kept quiet on Galwan, but then the cyclic opposition started off. Galwan has projected as a major victory for the PLA. How did they do it? For the Winter Olympics, which was uh, which was very important to China, uh, because even the Russians uh, invaded Ukraine after the Winter Olympics, right? So in the Winter Olympics, the flag bearer was a Galwan hero. So that is the indicator. That is the psychological operations they, they carry out. They had they, they ran campaigns uh, of writing slogans. And they said we will give you all the best ten slogans, and this will be done with Western Theater Command, uh, which looks uh, which looks after the Asia and the border. That the ten best slogans, starting on first of February, uh, would be given a precious stone from Galwan along with the certificate. Right. So, and they started in infiltrating our own media. Uh, they started uh, giving out a number of uh, 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 public. Uh, 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 press releases, Global Times, uh, mouthpiece. So you find uh, psychological operations were carried out by that. So that was Galwan. Perception management. The, the US spent you know, 20 years of deployment uh, in Afghanistan and then left Afghanistan uh, in 2021, one year from exactly a year and a couple of days from today. Uh, militarily, I think they did uh, they did rather well, but what they lack of perception management. Uh, they tried their best. It's not that they did not do. They have the brains, they have the money, they have everything. But I, I think they did not understand the culture. They established Afghani Afghani villages in their national training center, uh, and they were they were manned. The villages were uh, inhabited by Afghanis, uh, but somehow uh, they did not they understand the culture because. In perception management, culture is very important. If you are in uh, Nagaland, you have to behave like a Naga. And uh, Jai Shogin Chuan is speaking after me, he will tell you. And it's not behaving like a Naga. Uh, when you're in Nagaland, there are different tribes and you have to behave like their tribe. You, you, you have to be with them. You have to understand what their uh, aspirations are, uh, what their culture is, what their history is, what their traditions are, how they speak, uh, what do they eat, uh, their music. Uh, the dress, uh, every every tribe wore a different shawl. Uh, 
so when when you top off for that you have to address a target audience otherwise it doesn't work out a, a overall plan a generic plan for perception management not work out you have to address the aspirations of our, our, our people whom you are the target audience very important similarly in manipur uh, manipur is again diverse uh, india is diverse of course but the, the, the conflict regions even more diverse uh, the valley is totally different from the hill, hill tribes the hill tribes are totally, north is totally different from the south the east is different from the west so uh, when you talk of that you have to have a perception management uh, action plan a perception management focus a perception management uh, uh, a roll out for a particular target audience so that becomes uh, very important so you have a strategic uh, a communication philosophy but more important is equally is the communication strategies that you're going to uh, you know uh, uh, you want to roll out and there's nothing wrong with that when you talk of uh, people you should, people have to start believing in a great man you know uh, i uh, i said i'll be anecdotal and this is the last one after that i'll wind up i think my money or time i was doing 20 minutes i've taken about a little less than uh, in vietnam uh, the americans went in vietnam um, we, we all heard about vietnam so i'll not go to the kinetic part the non kinetic part so they started doing what we call as bhavna or bam ops which is you know uh, winning our hearts and minds and uh, they uh, they saw that the uh, the females would get up in the morning they would collect you know go to collect water go to collect wood come back and do all the household work that, that that happens in every country in our country especially in the hill areas uh, you always find the the women for for going in the morning they do all the so they started pipe water in the vietnam villages now that went anti because uh, you know the the women who used to go to the collect the water was their free time they would go they would you know gossip about there they would learn what's happening a lot of things would take place and that was totally the, the, they didn't like it at all when they had pipe water at home the work may have reduced but the outing which they had uh, so uh, the, the perception that you are doing them a great favor actually turned on its head uh, so these are small examples so when talk of perception management it has to be very very specific and that is where i think our on ground experience and that is where i say thank you for uh, introducing military men into the non kinetic field whether it's cbms or uh, whether it is uh, uh, talking about perception perception management cyclic operations very important we have uh, very various uh, structures within uh, but what, what we need is a national structure uh, which supported by resources supported by influences there are many influences in this in the in the indic research forums research forum you 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 have uh, influences uh, and you you have keyboard warriors uh, so the keyboard warriors uh, you have the content writers you have graphics Uh, you will have publications, and today in the interconnected world, uh, we have social media platforms where everything is very important. And today we are talking of virtual societal warfare, where I can change the way you behave, the way you think, and the way you believe. Uh, I change the value system. So that is what perception management is all about. And I land out there. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you to all the participants. Uh, thank you for giving the opportunity. Chair. Well, thank you very much, sir, for those excellent, outstanding remarks. Uh, Jan Bhatia brought out that all these psychological operations have to be people centric. People are the center of gravity of the whole thing. And in the context of Bala Kot and Burhan Wani, he very uh, clearly brought out the importance of our strategic communication, the way we interact with our population, and he also highlighted the role of the social media. Now, I would like to, and he also uh, highlighted the importance of having. formal structures which uh, presently we do not have and we need to have formal structures at the level of mod the armed forces and the information and broadcasting ministry now in this context i will also like to highlight the ongoing war between russia and ukraine how this perception management is playing its role where both the sides the russians and the west are putting out a narrative and which is if you read both the narrative you find you know they are quite opposite to each other so that's how they are building up the narrative uh, maybe for the population which are which is fighting there and for the world at large uh, now what i will do is i think general shokin chohan would take a while to join uh, in case there are any questions at this stage
uh, I would invite the questions from the audience. Sir, I think uh, General Chauhan, sir, has joined. So uh, if you could please confirm. Okay. Sir, you're there? Yeah, I'm there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what I'll do is without, uh, uh, you know, any f further delay, I'll request General Shokin Chauhan uh, to speak on the rehabilitation and reintegration of the uh, surrounded militants. Uh, he has been our, our DG Sam Rifles and chairman of the ceasefire monitoring group and our DA in Nepal. So he's eminently, I mean, he's uh, had the vast experience of dealing with this kind of a subject and de dealing with the uh, insurgency in Northeast. So over to you, General Shoki John. Thank you, General Badoria. Very kind of you. I have actually just reached and uh, I'm speaking to you from my mobile. Uh, and I would have really appreciated five more minutes, but uh, we, we can start. The, the issue, yeah, the issue about uh, reintegration, rehabilitation are you know, it, it's a complex situation. I, I was uh, listening to uh, General uh, uh, Vinod Bhatia speak. And what is what should be very clear is is that, you know, while I agree with every word there, uh, there, are, there are two things when you look at uh, rehabilitation and reintegration. Uh, let, let's take the issue about uh, the Naga insurgency. Uh, the Naga insurgency started in 1956. Uh, before that, in 1946, they had a pact to the government called the Hyderi Agreement, wherein the Nagas uh, had signed saying that we agree to join the Indian Union uh, for 10 years. But uh, after 10 years, we will take a decision. Unfortunately, uh, this, this was not agreed to by the uh, government, who, of, in part, uh, that being Prime Minister Nehru's uh, government, and they scrapped this agreement and instead decided that nobody can secede from India and that we would have to take this by force. So finally, in 1950, that is 10 years after the 46 agreement, the Naga started an armed insurgency. Now, this insurgency was based on what? It was based on freedom for Nagaland, which they said was not, they were never a part of India, where historically, actually, they weren't. But the issue was that exactly as General Badoria said, the reintegration and the rehabilitation should have started when we had independence. Probably we were so, you know, beset by so many issues, with so many problems that we were unable to look at the issue about reintegration and rehabilitation. And we decided that with force, we would be able to defeat the Nagas. This unfortunately didn't happen. This insurgency continues till today. Why does this continue? It continues because, as General Vinod Bhatia said, we simply don't seem to understand what the issue is. The issue is an integration. The issue is rehabilitation. How do we bring Nagaland into our fold? How do we integrate them within their society? Is something that we must continue looking at. Uh, I, I see my old friend Harjit also here. Harjit used to be uh, with me when I was a major in Ukru, he was the SP of Ukru district. And even then, uh, and Harjit would agree with me, uh, it, this was the time just after the Oinam incident. Uh, and the Oinam incident was where uh, we had uh, a Naga, the NSCN raid a 26, uh, 21 AR post at Oinam, uh, wherein they killed about 14 of our men and took away more than 110 weapons. Am I right, Harjit? So when this, right. Absolutely yeah. right. So, so when this happened, what was our reaction? Our reaction was meeting uh, force with force. And we almost wiped out the Oenam village. Uh, we, a large number of people were killed, maybe some innocent, maybe uh, some, uh, some not so innocent. But it affected the psyche of the Ukrul district. And the Ukrul district is actually the basis, the leadership of today's NSC and IM also. Muiva, uh, you have Atem, you have Anthony, uh, all the leadership of the NSC and IM, Fung Thing, everyone comes from the Ukrul district. And what they remember, because when we served in, in Ukrul district, what they remember most is this Oinam situation. 
And what is amazing is, uh, General Badoria will also agree, is that we simply did not go into ONM after that. Today we have vacated the ONM post, but no one has engaged the ONM village. I am also a trustee of the Sunbird Trust, which is uh, making schools and uh, hostels in the Northeast. And I'm very happy to tell you that uh, we were able to send a team of uh, of the Sunbird Trust to start the first school in Oenam. And when I was speaking to uh, the, the, the office bearers of the Sunbird Trust who are in Oenam, they told me that till today, there exists great amount of suspicion in the minds of the uh, of the Tankul Nagas, and especially in Oenam village. And I had to actually go over and tell them that, look, no matter what happens, we would have to forget this because your children have lost not one generation, but three generations after that. <laughs> so what we did and what we uh, and, and similarly, General Badoria mentioned the fact that I was a defense attache in Nepal. <laughs> In Nepal, after the uh, Janandolan II, when the mainstream political parties decided to get together and also agree with the Maoists who were fighting the government-led forces, the mainstream political parties were able to, uh, you know, bring the conflict to a close, but not before Prachanda declared victory over the government-led forces, which was not the case. He didn't win. He didn't enter Kathmandu. He, he didn't win any single battle in Kathmandu. And the RNA was not, was simply not defeated. But after the agreement that took place, the peace agreement, what we did was that uh, Prachanda said that he had 34,000 plus PLA fighters. So we said, okay. And since uh, the Government of India had nominated me as the points person, as well as the United Nations mission to Nepal had accepted that the Indian Defense Attaché had probably the most influence and knowledge in that area. I uh, often used to speak to Prachanda. So what we did was we established 18 camps in, in Nepal and we interred all these 34,000 plus fighters. Uh, we brought these uh, these containers, these empty ship containers, and we placed them in each one of these uh, these <coughs> camps. And we asked the Maoists, we, we had two locks, we had, uh, uh, you know, a spare set of keys, and we gave the Maoists a set of keys as well as uh, kept the, uh, the, the keys with, with us. And what we did was that for each camp, we didn't take the RNA the, because the uh, Prachanda would not have agreed. But what we did was that we he accepted that Indian Army ex, ex servicemen could uh, be responsible for the security of the camp and they were paid by the United Nations. So as a result, uh, we were able to establish a neutral presence there. And during this time that we were, uh, we were uh, looking after the, 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 the camp, and I visited those camps many times. We carried out three things, uh, which I'm sure once again, Harjit is in Geneva and uh, you know has been looking at this issue. But the first issue was verification of these gardens. Uh, we carried out a very detailed verification. Second issue was that we carried out rehabilitation. Now, what exactly is rehabilitation? We were able to give them some kind of skill whether it was farming, whether it was uh, mechanical skills, whether it was dairy farming, uh, as well as see their suitability for the induction, for their induction into the Royal Nepalese Army. Uh, what the Royal Nepalese Army agreed is that if a boy was found suitable from among these people's Liberation Army, uh, we, he would, they would recruit him, but provided he went through the recruitment process. So we did a detailed verification, took out the age group that would be suitable for the PL, for the Royal Nepalese Army, or now the Nepalese Army. And about 1,800 odd guarders were finally recruited into the Nepalese Army. As far as the leadership was concerned, uh, we were able to get this leadership to agree 
to join the Royal Nepalese Army Officers Academy and carry out a training for uh, for a year as per the Royal Nepalese Army uh, course. And this resulted in a proper system by which we could induct these PLA cadre into the Nepalese Army as well as induct their officers. The second thing that the Nepalese Army did was that they didn't allow more than two to three cadre in the same unit. Uh, that that's very important because it would have created a problem in integration. So when you are looking at integration and I, I did a very detailed study on this integration in Nepal and I suggested the same for the integration of the Naga hostiles uh, within India. Uh, you know, when I was the chairman of the ceasefire monitoring group, but uh, unfortunately we were not able to do it for the Naga hostiles because we've not come to a final agreement as yet. But in Nepal, and this has been a great success, the PLA has been totally integrated uh, with the Nepalese army. And the balance of the uh, PLA cadre who couldn't make it were given some kind of skills and have now happily rejoined society. There are three things I would like you to consider when you are looking at rehabilitation and reintegration. The first is, there is a need for having a big heart. We have to accept certain faults in the system. We have to accept falsehoods. And when we find this falsehood, we should not take an extreme step. That's the first thing. That means wear velvet gloves. The second thing is that prevail on the card because they actually have no other means of integration within the society. You have to prevail upon the cadre to accept the integration methods available. Once again, whether you give them a chance for business or you give them a pension for a couple of years, or you give them an, uh, a, a, a system by which they can integrate honorably and economically, that, that these issues have to be remembered. And the third issue is when you integrate them, do not now create a schism within them. We finally got the Nepalese army to send these boys as a part of Nepalese army units to the UN also, which is a wonderful step to getting these soldiers to integrate themselves. You know, there is there is a need uh, to, to uh, when you look at this for not for doing this with integrity, doing this in a system that we do not create a problem for themselves because people are as smart as anybody else. The second system that I found that that we could we could use honorably with the Nagas and I have uh, actually gone to the highest level to tell them that look if we had to have an agreement that agreement must have some kind of, uh, of standing the government uh, there must be a sovereign agreement. There must be a system by which the Nagas are not suspicious of us and that they accept the plan for integration. And my plan uh, for Nagaland, which I had told the NSA and the Home Ministry, was that for the first five years, all these cadres are given a stipend of about 15,000 rupees. Along with the stipend, the cadre that we find uh, suitable for induction into our police forces, uh, as we had done in the case of the of the Mizo insurgency in 1986, where we got, we created the 112 and 111 and 112 BSF battalions. Similar structures must be created for the Naga rebels, and give them a chance for integration. You would find that 95 percent would would agree to this. Unfortunately. Uh, because we've not been able to get an agreement with the Nagas, uh, this, this particular plan has been shelved. But whenever we do it, uh, the rehabilitation and reintegration can only take place through these issues. That is firstly, verification, and this verification should be in great detail. Secondly, provide them with life skills, which will allow them to integrate themselves within the system. And thirdly, along with this integration, we must... Uh, 
get the process of rehabilitating them, getting them, getting the suitable people, getting their leadership in some situation from where they feel there's a stake in the system. Uh, that's the problem where we, we are actually stuck. Uh, you are you are all aware that in 1976, uh, we, we, in 1975 rather, there was the Shillong Accord where the government of India had an accord with the Naga rebels and we, we uh, and they were to, they had accepted the NFG, the Naga federal government had accepted uh, the, the issues as far as uh, the government of India was concerned. But within a couple of months, Muiva and uh, 250 Carter, which were out of this situation and which were returning from uh, China after training, decided that they would not accept the Naga Accord. So there is no point having an accord if that accord is broken immediately. There is no point getting into an agreement if the agreement is not fair or if they perceive it to be fair. And for that, we should walk the extra mile. Uh, I am a uh, I, I have fought this insurgency in uh, in the Northeast for many, many years, uh, almost what, 15 years of my career. But what is most important is that when you are talking to the Northeast, as General Bhatia said, there is a need for us to integrate within the, that society. Uh, Northeast insurgencies, and there are so many of them, whether it's a Nagaland insurgency or it's the Manipur insurgency, or it is the Arunachal insurgency or South Assam insurgency or the earlier Mizo insurgency. Every insurgency has a different, different requirement. Every insurgency has a different issue involved because there are different tribes involved in, in carrying out this, uh, the, the, this insurgency. Every tribe has to be talked to, has to be spoken, their uh, insecurities have to be dealt with, and only then should we go into an agreement when we are absolutely certain. So this is, as far as I'm concerned, the rehabilitation and reintegration processes, uh, which I have actually been a member of, a part of, and I have great experience of, uh, and, I, and I'm absolutely clear that uh, unless we do this with our full heart, Unless we do this with absolute honesty and absolute integrity, no peace agreement will survive beyond the, the uh, beyond a couple of years. And it is no point getting into an insurgency which breaks uh, 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 an agreement which breaks up within within a couple of months, because then that insurgency is going to become more radical, more difficult to to get them back uh, to 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 the uh, to the table. Uh, that the time for closing this loop with the with Nagaland with the with the uh, Naga groups is now the leadership is uh, old uh, they have been in this insurgency for a very long time and they are looking for a place to settle down 90 percent of the Nagas uh, while they support the the the, the freedom struggle as they talk, as they call it are also looking to integrate themselves within Naga, within the within the within the country of India, and they economically look at being a part of India. And if these are the and these points are actually the issues which actually should give us the chance to successfully integrate them within the government, within our country. And for this integration, is what I've said: uh, get them first, sign the agreement, get them to camps. Uh, carry out a verification, give them rehabilitation skills, give them a stipend and allow them to honorably find their way within the society of Nagaland. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Janil Chauhan, for those excellent, outstanding remarks based on your huge experience in Northeast. Uh, now, what he highlighted was uh, some of the successes of the Indian state and uh, what comes to our mind is the Mizo where the leader of an insurgent group became the uh, chief minister, Lal Denga, and he was uh, integrated and rehabilitated, uh, rehabilitated. However, the same kind of success we did not achieve as far as Nagas are concerned. Probably the policy that we followed right in the beginning, soon after our independence, is responsible for that. He also highlighted how should we be rehabilitating these people and uh, one of the uh, major issues that he uh, highlighted was that uh, the accord or whatever we um, agreement that we have with them 
should be honorable. I mean, they shouldn't feel let down. They, they should be rehabilitated honorably. And he also gave a roadmap for the Naga insurgents to be rehabilitated and reintegrated into a society and the nation. Now, with those remarks, I would uh, now um, open the session for question answers. Uh, should you have any question answers, you can raise your hand and I can see the first one is Mr. Dave who wishes to ask a question. Please go uh, ahead. Sir, good afternoon. Uh, I hope you can hear all of you can hear me. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we can. Okay, sir. Uh, I just joined in but I got the message late. Uh, very nice and very uh, nice to hear the general. I couldn't hear General Bhatia's his experience is very high in the uh, CI grid. Uh, my home is in Northeast. Okay, sir. Uh, I have seen both sides of it. And the first conception which gets out is that the people want to severe away from India. It is an incorrect statement, sir. They all want to stay with India. Circumstances come to a situation where they have to finally pick up the arms. I'm being a little frank about it. Now, let's take when I was young and when all of us was young, we were there. There was only one insurgency area in the country that was Nagaland. Slowly and steadily, it spread into the complete Northeast. Why it spread is the main question, sir. That is the main issue of it. And if that why is done, you will be able to keep away insurgencies and CI grids away in this country at every places. If their regional aspirations are looked into, they are all willing to come into the mainstream, whatever little bit I have interacted with them. Now my interaction is very low into it. But then they require a chance for the general said is that rehabilitated them. Absolutely correct, sir. They require a rehabilitation. They all want to come back. So something the government of India has to do to get them back into the system. They are all willing and let not there like let's take today the red corridor today in the in India. Why is this red corridor so active? There is there is some aspirations which the people have there. So we have to look into all this into India in the regional aspirations, the people's aspirations, and then we have to get along with them. Just so much I want to tell about this. Let's, if anybody wants to can talk one-on-one uh, -on -one with me, sir. Uh, thank you. Shokan, you, do, you want to comment on that? Yeah, uh, can't sorry, hear. Mute. Yeah. No, no, you are muted. You so can't muted. hear you, Shokan. Uh, Madhuriya, sir, we have some questions in the chat box also. Uh, okay, can... Uh, so can you just highlight them because I can't open the chat box. I can just uh, take the questions. Yeah, yeah, but I have got that. Yeah. Uh, okay, let let me just go through them. Uh, A few already. Rajan Kocha sir has already answered in the chat. Okay, I'll just see. Yes. yes. Yeah, I I agree entirely, uh, Jaran Baduria, with uh, mm -hmm. Priyotosh. This is the right time. I, as I said, 90% of the Nagas identify themselves with India. Uh, their leadership has become old. The leadership is looking to settle down. But they want an honorable agreement. We have to give it to them. And unless we give them this agreement, uh, they, they, they've spent a lifetime fighting us. So they're not going to agree easily. Uh, I remember talking to, and, and this is all, I hope, uh, uh, you know, uh, Chatham House rules. No one is going to take this further. I remember talking to a senior functionary in the in the Home Ministry. And what he tells me is that we will offer Moiva uh, 100 crore rupees. Moiva is 85 years old. He has no children. What will he do with that 100 crore rupees? He is looking for an honorable exit. He's looking to have a justification for 85 years of his existence. Whatever agreement we have in Priyotosh, I agree with you. Uh, it has to be honorable. We have to get it through. And this is the right time. People don't want to fight us anymore. Yeah, uh, Jan Baduria? Yeah. yeah. 
Thanks, can thanks, okay. And now there are two. Can I just Sorry? do a review? Please, sir, please. Shokin Chauhan is there, and uh, Mr. Rajit Sandhu is also having a number of sound out there. I think today uh, the Northeast insurgency is Nagaland and even Manipur percent is more of an industry. Uh, there is no conviction. They they are they want to be part of the mainstream. There is no doubt about it. They are absolutely right. And uh, even even uh, you know much north north oh. north, like Kamdipur, uh, KLO and others, uh, Assam. It's become an industry. It's a win for everyone. The politicians win. The terrorist organizations or uh, the insurgents uh, insurgents win. Even the people went to an exchange uh, because the peace prevails over there. The violence levels are near zero. It's in the law and order domain. Uh, things were very bad at a point of time, but today they're very good. Uh, because of the security situation, uh, they get center funds. And uh, the most honest people, uh, unfortunately, feel that the center funds have to use dishonesty. Uh, correct me if I am wrong. They're, they're the most honest people. They don't even have locks on their doors or houses. Uh, but when it comes to center funds, uh, they think it is to be distributed as goodies. So I, I think more of an industry, right? For every bag of seeds, uh, guys that come in one rupee uh, to the insurgent row, one rupee to the government, uh, the, the system is so set and it's all been controlled by Marwadis, by the way. I just I, I just want to give my view of it. I agree entirely, sir. But the reason, you know, you have to also see why are they getting carders? Why are the mothers and the parents sending these carders to join these uh, insurgent groups? Every insurgency, as you are aware, sir, the center of gravity is the people. No insurgency can grow without the people accepting that this insurgency needs to continue. So if the parents are, and, and the Naga society, you are aware, sir, is a very family-oriented society. Uh, there is no way a child will join the insurgency if his parents don't agree. But the reason why the parents are agreeing is there has to be some justification, sir. So let's let's give them the the issue that there is a justification. Let's start with the process of integration by saying we agree that you have fought for the last fifty years. We agree that there have been some faults with our the way we have implemented situations. And now that we agreed to these two things, now let's get together and be a part of one country. And for that, I, I need to integrate you within our society. And for that integration within our society, these are what I am willing to give you. Sir, there has to be cultural integration. There has to be an acceptance of what they've done. There has to be an uh, uh, honorable integration. And unless that happens, sir, we will be fighting them all our life because uh, i'm sure as uh, you're a soldier too sir uh, this will never end we will continue to deploy troops we will continue to be involved in uh, you know and unnecessarily and un unfortunately get into situations like voting or chura chanpur sir and and again once again we will it it will be a cycle again sir because i remember sir and uh, you you all must have heard of khango he is the chairman of the NSC and Kaplan group, which became now the Kango group because Kaplan has died. I asked Kango, what are you fighting for? He's 80 years old. So Kango says, he told me, he says, sir, I am fighting for the integration of my Cognac brothers. So when this incident happened in Oting, I, was, I had already left the job, but I got a message from him wanting to speak to me. And he said, sir, I have asked the people of uh, of the Cognac region if I should stop the ceasefire and go back into an insurgency. So there is there is a system, sir. There is a reason why they are there, why the old people are still not giving up. And and like I said, sir, Kango is 80 years old. What is he going to do with money? So he is not there to take money. Maybe his car, Kango is not. And so also is Muiva. What is he going to do with that money? I have met Atim in his home. I have met Anthony in his home. Beyond a certain stage, they don't look at money anymore, sir. But there is this underlying situation that we have fought all our lives for a particular thing. Now, when we integrate, we must at least get some kind of issue with us. Right. It gives them a justification for the war that they have fought. To me, there can be no greater ability to close a war 
and and these kind of insurgencies sir no amount of kinetic methods can be ever ever uh, useful sir and finally it has to be the non kinetic method that will finally end an insurgency on rubili sir i have seen it with the prachanda sir prachanda uh, jal badoria you you could have mentioned prachanda also it's neighboring nepal yeah yeah uh, and prachanda became prime minister the insurgency ended ba baburam bhatrai became prime minister ram bahadur rai became a minister now these are all ex pla cadres sir and yet nepal survives as a, as, a, as a democracy so what are we afraid of sir in neighboring nepal which is 100 to our size they can do this why can't we we okay. have to bring these smaller insurgencies to a close sir there is no other way right uh thank you jan chohan i fully agree with you now the kind of geopolitical situation that we have in the south asia and in asia uh, we have a neighbor uh, which is uh, like jan bhatia said is on the lac becoming more assertive and they can exploit our fault lines howsoever small so i fully agree with you that it is time that we fill these fault lines and even if we have to walk a step further or an extra mile we must travel that and fill up these i mean remove these fault lines other otherwise our nation would not be able to develop the way we wish to develop because the kind of neighborhood and neighborhood that we have and more uh, uh, pro, uh, prominently uh, china which is breathing down our neck right now with that i would uh, request uh, mr sandhu he had a question so you can please go ahead uh, sorry i am mute can you can you hear me yes sir yeah, yeah i can hear you because i have two connections one is frozen so i don't know which one you if you can hear no, thank no, you, you so much uh, yeah. jinnar chauhan absolutely i agree with everything you said because i i only have just very quickly one is first we also while we are talking of reintegration there are lot of middle grounds as you will recall and you and general bhatia there are lot of middle ground who are with us and with them like they are so first we bring them give them something like we started these matches football and a lot of that putting them into so that they they trust you so it is comes to that secondly both of you must have seen there and anyone else in northeast that the tribals are by and large very honest they either love you or they hate you they are not hypocrites so i think if you are honest with them they definitely accept that this is my experience i was there from 1985 to 2000 1985 to 92 then again 2000 to 2002 so i have seen in various capacities as sp as commanding officer of a battalion as inspector general of, in charge of operation so that is one thing second i used to say that time which i still say to the younger officer if you cannot neutral neutralize one terrorist insurgent or underground at least do not create another one if 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 you follow the example of rathiam long from tamang long he was arrested in assam and i went with the full force to bring him back and very nicely i spoke to him sending everybody he used to be a professor of english so his story is which sells in the media a victim turned aggressor he was a innocent person arrested and detained and tortured he became so we have to keep both the things one side is media makes them hero sometimes unnecessarily but at the other time at least if we cannot neutralize one we have we should not create another one and rest everything that general chauhan you said i absolutely agree because it looked like i was speaking from the ground thank you so much for that thank you right uh, you have another question mr dev yeah you can unmute yourself and go ahead so i think he forgot to um, you know drop it no sir right. nothing sir i am okay. i am absolutely all right by mistake it has come sir right right is there anyone else who wishes to ask a question uh, we have questions in the chat box i can just take them okay okay i'll just see that right yes sir uh, uh, we have one question for general coach sir Uh, yeah. apart from i think he has answered but he can just uh, clear it again uh, apart from the trust uh, deficit one of the reasons for the constant hostility with pakistan is the ghq 
uh, Rawalpandi's uh, fear that any peace with India would undermine the military's clout in the country. How does one deal with that? See, uh, basically, it is a question of mindsets which I had actually mentioned. The mindsets of the Pakistan army and the Pakistan government have to change. Uh, having a peace in India, peace with India, does not mean the Pakistan army loses its importance. Pakistan army has got its importance in other ways also. So it is a, uh, it's a mindset. And this mindset has carried over for the last 75 years. And that is why uh, we are fighting with each other. If Pakistan has to move ahead, it has to not make its policy India centric. It has to look inwards. What is happening to the economy of Pakistan? The way Pakistan is going, let me uh, share that uh, in times to come, it will be another Afghanistan. Because uh, unless they, uh, I rein in these uh, terrorist groups and all these strong fundamentalist uh, Pakistan is going the Afghanistan way and uh, they will go in times to come so in case we want we want a stable Pakistan it is in interest of India also so this mindsets of these uh, generals in Pakistan because they are get, uh, getting too many freebies because the all important uh, positions in the government after it and are uh, you know they are appointed in all important functions they are, uh, I mean, um, uh, you know, heading the state bodies there. So they want everything, uh, even after retirement. So things have to change. And I will conclude by uh, saying that unless Pakistan looks inwards, Pakistan is in for trouble. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I can see Jan Dushan saying, uh, would you like to remark on anything? No, can't hear you. Can't hear you. So you're on mute. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jan uh, Rakesh. Actually, uh, I am just coming out of a program from, uh, uh, you know, it was a very high level program. So I'm just coming out of it and trying to recover from that program. And uh, I shall join as uh, my turn comes in. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we have so, uh, some questions. Yeah. We have one question uh, from. Yesh Pun, uh, question for General Bhatia, sir. In the context of perception management, we see that uh, Pakistani intelligence uses the Western media to its advantage for setting false narrative. Uh, do you think Indian security establishment should use this? And if it, uh, how far and effective has it been uh, used until now? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for pointing this out. I actually missed this out. It's a very important part of perception management cycling of here. Exceedingly important part. Uh, uh, when you have to uh, address the international audience and even your own audience, sometimes we, you know, the, the naysayers, they believe more in a foreign a foreign paper than we believe in our paper. If you look at the world, yes, DG, DG ISPR uh, is uh, very active uh, in, uh, the, in the media, especially the Western media. They're very, very active and they, they do uh, put out things uh, which are there, uh, which suit them. Uh, if you look at the media, it's controlled by people who want uh, to do perception management. Uh, the, the New York Times is controlled by uh, uh, you know, Donald Trump's uh, son-in-law. The Washington Post is controlled by the Amazon people. Jeff Bezos. Similarly, every, every all of the media. Look at the Chinese. What they do? The Chinese control the Hollywood. Uh, the money, the Hollywood money comes. You never see a Chinese being portrayed uh, adversely or something. You know. Uh, in a bad manner in the Hollywood films, why? And all, all, all the uh, uh, you find uh, Kung Fu Panda and others, and who sees it? Our, our people are seeing it. Our children are seeing it. Our grandchildren are seeing it. And they're watching all the all, all the Chinese things. We we have forgotten what is, they talk of Mr. America. They talk of you know uh, Iron Man and this man and that man, Spider Man. No one talks to Mr. India. Okay, these are very important. Foreign media is very important. Not the newspaper media for the others. Uh, uh, I'll take a second more. Look at China, what it does. It imports, it let, it screens only 32 foreign movies in a year. Right? Such a huge market. So if a movie is screened in China, it makes a lot of money. That's how they control it. So you never, you never find any movie uh, which will show the Chinese 
uh, in a bad light. A, a China man, a Chinese, a Chinese culture, Chinese civilization. Uh, earlier, you have billions who are Chinese, but now you don't see it, see them anymore. Uh, because anyone who gets a release in China, and uh, that is, you know, must be reading about Lal Singh Chadda, that controversy. Well, uh, uh, Three Idiots was a hit in China, one of the biggest hits in China, Three Idiots. They made, they made a lot of money out there, and why not? What is wrong with it? So foreign media is a must. I think we, that, that's why when we have structures, when we IND, and you know, when I, when I covered IND, I also had Ministry of Finance, because we got to finance the, uh, the perception management campaign. Where do the finances come from? Budget is very important. Thank you. Right. Uh, I think there are no more questions. So what I'll do is now I'll wind it up. Uh, firstly, let me thank the eminent panelists for their excellent remarks. And as a closing remark, all that I have to say is that in USI, we conducted a two-day exercise uh, to see what are the security challenges that our country is going to face in the next five years, because there are some very important events which are going to take place in uh, two, three years' time. So what are the challenges that we face? And um, one of the things that, was, that stood out was our social fault lines, uh, both in Jammu and Kashmir, in Northeast and elsewhere. Unless we do something about it, these can be exploited by our um, adversaries uh, and they'll be detrimental to our national security. And the other issue was our strategic communication. We lack the ability to put out our narrative uh, which uh, people accept and um, uh, that is some way, something which Jan Bhatia also pointed out that we need to have structures for that. We need to build our narrative and put it out in the social media and elsewhere so that uh, our side of the story is heard and accepted. So with that, I'd like to thank the Indic Forum uh, for having given us the opportunity uh, to have this kind of a dialogue. Uh, and look forward to meeting you sometime later. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. I thank our session chair and our all the keynote speakers for joining us and providing us in, insights on, on the Indian Army's non-kinetic approach to counterterrorism. As sir said, uh, this all we, ca we can't just read it from the books and uh, it just comes out a lot of experience. And uh, with this, we have come to the end of our fifth session. Uh, all the I request all the participants to share their questions in the chat box with their email ladies so that uh, uh, considering the time constraint, we can just uh, take those questions and forward it to the respective speakers and get back to you. And uh, yes, uh, so stay tuned for our next session on decoding different aspects of terrorism. Thank you for joining. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jai Hind.